Hello friends, before you comment, please remember, you asked for this. I rarely talk about live action on this channel, but when I do, it's usually to discuss animated adaptations, and some of my favourites are the original theatrical releases of Scooby-Doo. As you know, I'm a cultured man with a very advanced palette, and Scooby-Doo is the apex of our culture. I'm a huge fan of the cowardly great Dean and his friends, and have waited forever for them to return to the big screen. And after 16 years of directed television films chugged out on a yearly basis, it was announced that Scooby-Doo would be returning in a 100% animated film featuring no live action to speak of. For all four of you that are unaware, Scooby-Doo is an old Hanna-Barbera cartoon revolving around a group of meddling kids solving mysteries by unmasking monsters that more often than not turn out to be people blinded by their own greed. The series skyrocketed in popularity, creating a humongous franchise and extended universe of Hanna-Barbera characters, which mostly consisted in teams of mystery-solving groups of kids derivative of the original Mystery Inc. gang. The show has been rebooted, reimagined, re-whatever else into the grind with countless spin-offs and movies, but it wasn't until 2002 where we got the gang's jump to the silver screen to less than stellar results. The first Scooby-Doo movie was directed by James Gunn, who had initially intended for it to be for a more mature audience, until ultimately needing to tone a ton of content down during production. You can really tell the constant switching of directions in the final film, and I feel it greatly hindered the end product. But despite doing pretty terrible critically, the movie was a big enough hit financially to warrant a sequel. Since they most likely went into this one with a clearer understanding of their target demographic, and more experience in working with these characters, what came out of it is a film that, in my opinion, is genuinely great. Run, run, shot it's nothing earth-shattering, but for what it is, I think Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed told a really solid story about the relationship between Scooby, Shaggy, and the rest of Mystery Inc. It had genuine heartfelt moments, a fun mystery for kids, and jokes that still make me laugh all these years later. This is tied for the most terrifying day of my life! I was lost every other freaking day of my life! <laughs> Sadly, this film's greatness was not recognized by critics, and thus, despite being better in every single way, it ended up reviewing just as bad as the first movie, and didn't even manage to rake in $200 million, putting the final nail in the coffin for the live-action Scooby-Doo movies. Theatrical live-action Scooby-Doo movies. James Gunn actually let people know what the third movie would have been about not too long ago. He said, The Mystery Inc. gang are hired by a town in Scotland to complain they're being plagued by monsters. But we discover throughout the film that monsters are actually the victims, and Scooby and Shaggy have to come to terms with their own prejudices and narrow belief systems. Yes, really. This seems like a pretty unique idea for Scooby-Doo that's rarely tackled, let alone the whole focus of the movie. Jinkies. We really are in the worst timeline. After the failure of Scooby-Doo 2, it looked like we were never going to get another Scooby-Doo movie again for the foreseeable future. Then, in August of 2019, we started seeing licked renders of characters like Shaggy. This design had me pumped, because, like, you see, you see the white stuff? It's like, it's an undershirt. Y you know what else does that? The live action movies. Leading up to its release, this really seemed like we'd be getting the best of both worlds. The funny, satirical writing of the live action movies, but portrayed through a medium that allowed these characters to exaggerate their performances and do things not possible in live action. As the months rolled on, we started getting more information in the movie. More leaks rolled in, more visuals were shown, and. Uh. They finally make it to the gates of hell where they have to fight Cerberus and Snidley finds Mutley, who it turns out has been trapped in hell for years. Then Scooby or Shaggy have to stay behind because that's how the door works. Shaggy stays behind which sends him back in time and he builds a statue on ancient Greece that tells everyone how to save him? <laughs> Man, that movie sure was a mess. But I'm at least glad I could hear it in a crisp quality thanks to Recon. Whoa, those look so cool! Recon is a top-of-the-line earbud that you can afford for half the price of its competitors. Not surprising considering it was co-founded by Rega. Wait, that's the music genre. Oh, Red Jet. <laughs> Whoops. Recon is really good for noise isolation and jiving to tunes from some of my favorite artists, like Snoop Dogg and Cardi B and Brandy, who also use Recons. What a coincidence. Recons are some of the most convenient earbuds I've ever used. The carrying case they come in can charge the earbuds four times in a single charge. The model I'm using is the Everyday E25 earbud, which holds a charge of six hours, has more bass, seamlessly pairs with any Bluetooth device I own, Get your model today in a variety of colors in the description below. If you click my link and go to buyrecon.com slash lsmark, you get 15% off and help support the channel. Thank you, Recon, for sponsoring this video and for helping me isolate the noise of this awful movie. So, uh, yeah, this was a thing now. We have Scooby making a Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe, sealing the gates of hail, and, uh, Cerberus? A Alexander the Great? James? Please.
Come back. Please. While the idea of having a Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe makes sense on paper, the more thought you give to it, the more you see it kind of falling apart. With Marvel, the characters are relatively consistent, and even though magic and science coexist, they seem to work well with each other. In Hanna-Barbera, though, you have the Flintstones and the Jetsons? How do you get them to work without this being arbitrary or confusing? How do you make a standalone Captain Caveman movie? Why would anyone care? Marvel started us off with a character the popular conscious didn't care about at the time, but the difference is he had character, he was charming, and it was a self-contained story. Here they just… they throw everything at you. There's no time taken to really set up the characters and get to know this iteration of Scooby-Doo. While most people would probably argue that since Scooby-Doo is so popular we don't really need to re-establish the characters, but in this context it's definitely necessary. This is no longer just about Scooby-Doo, it's about an entire universe now. And Mystery Inc. feels so incredibly out of place in a universe with superheroes, the gates of hell, and demigods and stuff. It's a new interpretation of the franchise, and we need to know how this version of Mystery Inc. operates, what their character dynamics are, and how this new singular world functions. These problems are exacerbated further when the inciting incident of this whole new cinematic universe is done extremely poorly. Simon Cowell, who just appears by the way. Me just simply stating his name is about as much context given in the film. Oh man, it's Simon Cowell! But anyway, he insists that Shaggy and Scooby are useless and won't invest in the startup Mystery Inc. company if they stay on. But we hardly see Shaggy and Scooby screw up or feel the gang in any meaningful way. The most they do is just focus on lunch too much or hide in a closet. That, that's it. To compare this to the inciting incident of Scooby-Doo 2, where Shaggy and Scooby's incompetence kicks off the entire conflict of the movie. There's a direct cause and effect, whereas here it's just Simon Kyle demanding a conflict to be there. Even then, the guy don't really seem interested in parting with Shaggy and Scooby. They don't accept the deal, or even seem tempted by it at all. So Shaggy and Scooby going off on their own to sulk feels really unearned. It's incredibly weak and it wouldn't be so frustrating if it felt so easy to fix. Why not have the investor be the antagonist in disguise, or another Hanna-Barbera character to subtly introduce the wider universe? Why not have the gang talk about not leaving behind Shaggy or Scooby, but trying to convince them to be less of themselves so they're a better sell? I'm harping on this a lot because the inciting incident is the most important part of any story. It's the moment that gets you invested into the characters and sympathize with their plight. This movie assumes you know Scooby-Doo, and you can just fill in the blanks yourself, which is lazy and cheap. There are moments that directly reference character quirks and make fun of it despite said characters not even really exhibiting them. Oh, jinkies. What? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, someone had to say it. The only way you would understand these jokes are by already having prior knowledge of the property. Scooby-Doo 2 was a sequel, and it still invests you and sets you up for the events of the movie without relying on the source material, lame meta-humor, or even the first movie. What's Scoob's excuse? Uh, the robots attacked this talking dog and a gangly dude that had this habit of using the word like, almost as if he was some middle-aged man's idea of how a teenage hippie talks. What's frustrating is that the entire movie relies on you being a Hanna-Barbera fan to keep you invested. After Shaggy and Scooby leave off on their own, the film largely becomes a Blue Falcon movie, with Scooby taking on an important secondary role. If anything, the movie has a more completed and thought-out arc for the Blue Falcon than it does for Scooby and Shaggy, who are largely sidelined, although not nearly as bad as Fred, Velma, and Daphne, whose sole purpose in this movie is to exposit the plot and chug it along like a steam locomotive on its last legs. I think you can! I think you can! I think you can! Oh, I couldn't. Um, but, uh, the movie as a whole, in general, uh, I really like it. In addition to feeling these characters, it feels to be funny or interesting. Try and do something! <laughs> like what? Like drop some F-bombs! Hey man, whoa, let's keep it PG. A lot of the humor in this movie is vapid, relies on pop culture, or the funny poopy fart jokes. Very rarely did I get a chuckle from this movie, and most of the time it was at its expense, rather than at any joke it earnestly presented me. Most of the time they'll just reference something and expect you to think it's funny. What's worse is that they have the audacity to linger on it. When a character tells a lame joke, every character feels the need to add on their own witty little punchline. This problem is exacerbated further due to the terrible voice acting. There isn't a single performance in this movie that I can praise. The best compliment I could give it is that largely everyone gives a passable performance, with two major exceptions, Shaggy and Scooby. Will Forte is a fantastic voice actor and I love his roles, but he's no Shaggy. There are times I can hear Will Forte struggle to put on a voice. Yeah, he's not that smart. Just sounds like it because he's British. When he tries to do a different accent and character, you can hear his vocal cords being shredded apart like my legal documents. Even though Scooby is voiced by Frank Welker, who's been voicing the character for decades, the problem doesn't lie in his performance, it's as consistent as ever. He doesn't sound at all different from the way he's voiced the famous canine for years. The problem here is that Scooby talks. 
a lot. Way more than necessary. If you watch most Scooby-Doo stuff before the late 2000s, you'll notice just how little Scooby actually talks. Most of his character was conveyed through physical humour, screams and grunts, or pantomiming. Here, though, they barely give us that luxury. And instead, we have to listen to Frank Welker desperately try to give a heartfelt performance as a talking dog with a speech impediment. Waggy, you promised you'd never leave. Come home. This movie makes attempts to be more dramatic, serious, and complex, and it winds up just making things worse and more needlessly complicated. Instead of being a fun, focused mystery story, it's instead a Hunt for the MacGuffins film that feels simultaneously incredibly fast-paced yet really slow at the same time. It feels like a lot of things are happening, but that's only because the film is juggling three different perspectives at once, along with throwing you in a variety of new locations. It feels like a lack of focus when really the focus is set squarely on making a new cinematic universe. It's honestly disorienting. I could show you five screenshots in quick succession, and you'd have no idea they were from the same movie. It's a shame because the art direction overall is pretty good. Characters animate beautifully, the storyboarding and posing is clear and crisp, everything is very readable. You could turn the volume off entirely and still understand what's going on in every scene, it's fantastic. I especially love the setting and background art. The abandoned amusement park in Romania is gorgeously lit, and manages to make a brown, dirty environment look interesting and honestly pretty tense. The only real beef I have is with the character designs. For as talented and skilled as the animation department is, the character design is widely inconsistent, and at points, pretty bad. Shaggy and Scooby feel relatively faithful to their original counterparts, yet Velma, Daphne and Fred look as if they're from an entirely different movie. This is the core cast and yet they don't look like they belong together. The anatomy is so weird and jarring. We have Fred, whose face is relatively normal, and then you have Shaggy, who has big expressive eyes, a wide mouth, and a big frickin' melon head. Velma and Daphne look way more like Barbie dolls than anything else. It feels weird to say, but they look… conventionally attractive, I guess. If you're gonna have Scooby and Shaggy be cartoons without a hint of realism, why not exaggerate the others? Why not make Fred a buffed Chad? Why not make Velma a short stack nerd? Why not make Daphne look like a supermodel or more cartoony? It doesn't even stop at the gang. Blue Falcon and Dino Moat look like they're from a completely different genre altogether. Their sidekick looks straight up like a Fortnite skin, and Dick dastardly. Oh Dick, sweet summer angel. Probably the most fateful design in the entire movie. Even better than Scooby. He's fantastically translated into this new iteration, and yet we can't appreciate it because everyone else looks so out of place. The worst part though, the teeth. <laughs> After having sunk my teeth into this film, twice, I think I can safely affirm that this movie is not a good, it's just not a good. Put that in the poster. It's amazing how inconsistent in quality this movie is. It goes from 0 to 100, back to 0, then 100 again. It has some gorgeous moments of animation, paired with genuinely poor character design. It has a story that sounds fun and adventurous, yet winds up being dull and needlessly convoluted. It's a mixed bag. I can understand why people like this movie, but it genuinely frustrates me. I love this series, and I know there's a great amount of untapped potential for it, and even a Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe, but as a first attempt, this is really piss poor and misfired. I can only hope that the next inevitable reboot will be much better. Anyway, that's my video. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, um, why are the endings to your videos so bad?